Hello and welcome to Surviving to Thriving. Through this program, we will cover anxiety management, managing stress, time management, managing procrastination, and finally, facing failure. We will begin with anxiety management. And where better to begin than with breathing? When people discuss anxiety management techniques, they usually talk about breathing techniques. So many of us know that we need to focus on our breathing when we are struggling with anxiety, but not many of us know why. When people are struggling with anxiety, maybe even having a panic attack, they most frequently breathe in a rapid, shallow breathing style, usually focused in the chest area, which accounts for about 30 to 40% of your potential lung capacity. However, the lung's capacity can drop down to 20 to 30% when breathing in shallow, rapid breaths. This amount of oxygen absorption is not good for the body. In fact, it can cause oxygen deprivation, also known as hypoxia. Let's take a moment to look at some of the symptoms of hypoxia alongside the symptoms of a potential panic attack. So they start with anxiety. They move on to confusion and difficulty breathing. Dizziness and lightheadedness you can have as well. Headaches, restlessness, increased heart rate. The list goes on for both of them. But as you can see from the initial list, the potential symptoms are identical. I am not saying that hypoxia and panic attacks are the same thing, but this comparison shows why anxiety management focuses on the breath and increasing one's oxygen intake. When the brain is deprived of oxygen for extended periods, it begins to shut down based on evolutionary necessity and priority. And what evolution classifies as a priority differ for, differs from what we think is a priority in our modern day lives. Now we arrive in safe mode. What I might mean by this is the brain will always prioritize preserving life by focusing on safety and potential threats. For example, in this situation, finding more oxygen. I like to call this state safe mode. Have you ever had your computer go into safe mode, where it'll do what it needs to, but nothing else? With the brain, it is doing this in a literal sense, keeping your life safe and well. Instead of answering that complicated question you are stuck on an interview or an exam, it is looking for the exit. Imagine that you will cross the road in an oxygen-deprived state and your brain is only observing potential risks in safe mode. You reach the edge of the road. Your vision only sees the cars, the buses, the cyclists, the runners. You then rush across the road when you think it's safe to do so. All you've seen is potential risks, nothing else. Now, let's imagine the same situation, but this time you are in a fully oxygenated state with your brain in what we will now call normal operational mode. For the purpose of this analogy, let's think again about it. So, you reach now the edge of the road. You observe the cars, the buses, the cyclists, the runners, the people, and so on. You wait to cross at an appropriately safe time, while you also observe all the potential risks, as well as taking in the day, the beautiful weather above, even the birds flying overhead, and anything else happening at that time. By observing the entire situation, you are aware of not only the potential risks, but also all that is happening around you. Have you ever noticed this in your life? When you are stressed, worried, or anxious, you see one problem, then another, and then another, building and building and building within your mind. This may be due to your anxiety, which may be worsened through reduction in your oxygen levels for your brain is in a state of looking for problems and potential risks. Focusing on your breathing allows you to re-establish your oxygen levels, which in turn reactivates your full brain's potential. I am not saying that this oxygen will magically fix all of your problems, but it will take you from problem finding to problem solving. You will become aware of the entire situation through holistic observations of your environment. 
the importance of practice. There are numerous breathing methods and approaches, from visualization of shapes, where your breath travels around them, imagining yourself in a safe place, through to counting and beyond. In truth, they all can work. However, for them to work, they need to be embodied in the person through regular practice. With our practice, the image I have for you is of David and Goliath, but David has no stones. For those who may not have heard of David and Goliath from the Bible, it is a story of a young shepherd who was incredibly talented with a slingshot. And he represented his tribe in a duel against the strongest warrior of the opposing side, called Goliath. The two were sent to fight each other, to not have more men die in battle. David was a young small shepherd walking towards the undefeated gargantuan warrior of called Goliath. But as he did, he picked up a stone, spun it above his head, and catapulted it and projected this projectile at Goliath's head hitting the warrior on the temple and ending his life there and then. But imagine for a moment this small shepherd in the same situation without any stones. The outcome would be undoubtedly have been very different. By utilizing practice, we learn to embody techniques so they are there when we need them. With practice, David goes from being a guy without any stones into becoming Bruce Lee. For anyone who does not know who Bruce Lee is, arguably one of the greatest martial artists of his era, do look him up. But in the immortal words of Bruce Lee, I do not fear the man who has practiced 10,000 kicks once, but I do fear the man who has practiced one kick 10,000 times. I suggest practicing one or two times daily in a calm, relaxed state. Practicing in such a state can imprint upon the technique. Meaning, when you utilize it, you will remember those times when you were previously relaxed, which can increase the feelings of calm when you need it most. Two words to remember. When we are in a panic state with depleted oxygen levels, most people do not remember to think of a shape, count specific numbers, or even be able to visualize a place they would prefer to be. So I developed my technique to focus on these two words, a mantra, if you will, which I hope most of us can remember even in an oxygen deprived state. They are slow down. That's it, slow down. You can extend it to slow down the breath, but that doesn't stick. If that doesn't stick, then simply slow down. Now arrive at the technique. Now this technique is an accumulation of the varieties of methods in the world. It starts with breathing in through the nose and focusing the breath into the belly, which can count, account for about 60% of the oxygen absorption in the body. You continue like a wave to inflate your lungs into your upper chest, accounting for 30 to 40% of your lungs capacity. Finally, you inflate the upper lungs, raising your shoulders to your ears. Pause for a moment, and then you exhale through the mouth, allowing the shoulders, the chest, and the belly to return to their neutral position. Repeat this technique for as long as it is needed. This technique utilizes about 80 to 100% of a person's lung capacity. Remember I said the technique follows the mantra of slow down. With this in mind, you may start inhaling rapidly like this. But you remember to slow down. Focusing the slowing the breaths into a more regular breathing pattern. Now I will demonstrate this technique for you three times. Feel free to join in if you want. So we breathe in first, in through the nose, into the belly, into the chest, raise the shoulders, hold. And then we exhale through the mouth, allowing the shoulders, chest, and belly to return things. We breathe in again. Breathe in. Hold. And exhale. Last one. Okay, so let's breathe in together. Breathe in. Hold. And exhale.
There you have it. Take a moment to reflect on how you feel right now after doing those breaths. This technique also comes with what I call a psychological trip switch. I'll explain. The part of this technique that, being honest, looks a little weird is what I'm referring to. Asking you to raise your shoulders to your ears and let them return to their resting position. Have you ever heard the phrase, I feel like I got the whole world on my shoulders? Or have you ever noticed where your shoulders are when you're stressed at your desk working? Are they up here by your ears? Have you ever, or has someone you know, when they get home from a hard day's work, let their whole body flop onto the sofa or the bed to rest? These situations and numerous others have told us that having our shoulders tensed up to our ears like this equals stress. And when they are down in a rest position, this equals relaxation. Incorporating them, this movement of drawing the shoulders towards the ears and allowing them to drop back down into the resting position can trip a psychological switch within us. Our brains notice we are allowing the shoulders to drop, like when we're relaxed. The brain may think, maybe I'm relaxed. Then it will open pathways and channels within the body to allow the oxygenated blood to circulate more effectively increasing the effectiveness of this technique. When to use this technique is the next question. I recommend using an anxiety ometer. Imagine in your head a scale of zero equals as calm as you can be. So calm, in fact, you're nearly falling asleep. 10, on the other hand, you are sitting on the edge of an erupting volcano. Answer this question. If you were sitting on the edge of an erupting volcano, debris is landing around you, eggs are frying around your feet, molten lava is approaching, what should you do? The answer I hope most of you is saying is run. When we are in a state of this state of anxiety, there is only one thing we can do, for our bodies only have one response to that level of anxiety, and that's to get away. So for any anxiety management to be effective, we must utilize it when it can be most effective. The earlier we deploy the anxiety management technique, the more effective it will be. I want you to keep the anxiety ometer in your mind. When you feel like a five out of 10, deploy the technique. But if you feel that a five out of 10 is too late and it has gravity taking it towards that volcano, then try maybe a four out of 10 or even a three out of 10. The earlier you deploy this technique, the more effective it will be. Finally, here are the key points I'd like you to take away from this video. When we are anxious, we focus on the breath because many of us enter rapid, shallow breathing patterns, leading to potential oxygen reduction in the body. Number two, when the brain is deprived of oxygen, it focuses on keeping us alive, leading to a risk focused mindset. Number three, utilizing a deep, full lung breathing technique reestablishes oxygen throughout the body and the brain, reactivating its potential to solve problems. Number four, practicing breathing techniques ensures a person can utilize them when needed. Number five, Practicing when calm and relaxed can imprint onto the technique to increase feelings of calm when required. Number six, raising and lowering the shoulders not only accesses the upper lung area, but also trips the psychological switch to increase the technique's effectiveness. Number seven, anxiety -ometers. Remember, the earlier you deploy the technique, the more effective it will be. There you have it. That's my approach to anxiety management, which I hope serves you should you ever need it. In life, we don't just get short-term anxiety stress like in an interview, an exam, or similar. We also get long-term stressful situations from projects, long-term deadlines, increasingly worsening conditions, and more. We need to manage this, which leads to the creation of this part of surviving to thriving. 
We will begin with how the human body works, focusing on how it reacts to stress. This begins by looking at the hormone called adrenaline, which can only be described as amazing. We have to accept how amazing adrenaline is, for without adrenaline, our species would have disappeared into the history of our planet's evolution due to the numerous dangerous situations in which the human race where adrenaline actually got us to safety. Adrenaline is designed for life or death situations. The three most common responses to adrenaline are fight, flight, or freeze. Let's review these responses, starting with freeze. This is currently believed to be a response where the individual will reduce the potential for harm by playing possum, where the person will remain motionless in an effort to make the attacker lose interest and leave them alone. Fight or flight, I prefer to explain these responses through an example. Let's imagine for a moment I was trapped in the room with a tiger. Now, the average weight of a fully grown male tiger is in the region of 350 kilograms. In comparison, I only weigh a mere 80 kilograms in this very moment. No matter which way you look at it, I am in a lot of trouble being stuck in a room with a tiger. In such a scenario, adrenaline would be coursing through my body to help me in several ways. The first, I would enter a flight response where I would become acutely aware of any potential exit through hypervigilance. Then the adrenaline would arrive in my muscles, allowing me to move as fast as possible to that very exit. Should the tiger be between me and the exit, I would transfer from flight to fight. The fight response accelerates and increases the muscles to their highest potential as well as numbing the pain responses, enabling the person to focus on fighting instead of the damage they are receiving in the conflict. This is why many fighters start to feel pain quite a long time after the fight. Now, not many people will end up in a room with a tiger unless you're a vet, a zoologist, or you're having a very unusual safari experience. We may not end up in the room with a tiger in our modern day lives, but our minds perceive the world differently from what we actually experience. Our imaginations are the cause of this. For it has been found that the mind can often struggle to differentiate between what is real and what is imagined. Now imagine you received 10 gold bars and put them in a bank. A week later, you think, I'd like to see my shiny gold bars. You walk into the bank and ask the clerk to see your 10 gold bars. The clerk then says, we're, we're really sorry to inform you, but we appear to have uh, misplaced your gold bars, um, which means we only have nine remaining. Would anyone be a wee bit pissed that they had misplaced a $250,000 gold bar? I would be furious. Despite the comprehensive awareness that adrenaline dis dissipates over time, I am suggesting through this analogy that it does not dissipate as quickly as we've been led to believe. Imagine that you were in the room with that tiger again. As you went to run, the adrenaline you had dissipated, leaving you in with no burst of energy to get to safety. Would you be freaking out in that situation? I would be. This brings us to Formula One cars. Don't worry, it'll make sense shortly. The average combustion engine car idles, meaning when it sits still with the engine on, at around 600 to 800 RPM, revolutions per minute and then will rev up to 6,000 RPM. A Formula One car idles at 5,000 RPM and will rev up to 15,000 RPM. Only elite sports cars can get that high. Formula One car engines will spin at nearly the highest rate of the average production car, just sitting at the start gate. Formula One cars require their entire engines to be overhauled following every race due to the amount of pressure and strain they go through during one race. Formula One cars operate at the maximum potential of the engine's capacity every race, burning themselves out in that race. We arrive at why I share such seemingly random information about Formula One cars. Adrenaline is an amazing hormone that releases the incredible potential of your body. There is 
records and accounts of mothers lifting cars to save their children's lives despite never lifting anything as heavy as that ever before. I'm not saying they lift the cars like the Incredible Hulk over their heads and spin them like pizza dough in one hand. Still, they are able to lift that vehicle enough for the children to crawl to safety thanks to the full potential of their muscles being released due to the adrenaline coursing through their bodies. That is how powerful adrenaline can make us. We are not designed to operate at 100% capacity all the time. We are designed to operate at 80% capacity at the maximum. When we get adrenaline released into our system, it is intended to be used. But if we are not in a situation where we can use it, for example, an exam, then we get those, these buildups of adrenaline in our systems. Is adrenaline in your system right now? How do we recognize if we have adrenaline in our systems? Potential signs and symptoms of buildups of adrenaline in the body are tension in the shoulders and upper back, especially between the shoulder blades. After typing excessively at your computer, your hands and fingers are shaking. Going to bed and you can't stay still. You just can't relax. Please remember these could be possible indicators of buildups of adrenaline in the human body. But if you're experiencing any of these symptoms, please also consider seeing your medical practitioner to review. At this point, it is essential to mention that stress is recognized as one of the main exacerbators of physical and mental illnesses. I would put forward that long-term exposure to adrenaline is one of these exacerbators, which worsen physical and mental conditions due to the amount of strain it puts the mind and body through. I have good news. I have identified how to get adrenaline out of your system through processing it out of the body. Adrenaline is designed to be used, which is what we must do, which we can do most effectively through the flight response. You can process the adrenaline out of the body through physical movement, releasing you from the strain that incredible hormone places upon your system. The technique is designed around high intensity interval training principles, HIT for short. To do this, you go to an open space like a field or a park or a track where you can run safely. You place two markers at distances you can sprint at your full power, or maybe 20. 30, 50 meters or more apart, as though your life depends on it. What I mean by sprinting like your life depends on it is imagine like you're running from a big scary dog, or you're trying to catch that last train home, or you're in that moment in the movie where the ground is falling away beneath you and you need a sprint to grab the ledge before you fall. After sprinting with all your energy, imagining whatever allows you to give your all, you reach the marker, you stop, you recharge, you catch your breath. When you have recovered, you sprint then again. You rest, you recover, and then sprint. You repeat until you are exhausted. Through this exercise, you begin to process the adrenaline out of your system the way it was designed to be used. Here's a warning though. This process can be cathartic, meaning that through this exercise, as you process the adrenaline out of your system, you can also start to process the emotions that cause the adrenaline in the first place. What I mean by this is that you can begin to cry or rage as you run, maybe even express the situations which led to you needing to run. For example, you begin to swear and shout your boss's name as you run, call them all the names under the sun. With this in mind, I suggest going to a place where you may not be overheard as you run. If you have ever been through any form of trauma or significant events, I recommend taking a friend or a family member with you, or someone at least you trust. So should you require support, someone is there to provide it. Now, most of you watching this video would have lived through lockdowns, where we have been unable to leave our homes for significant periods of time. In response, I've developed a way to process adrenaline out of the body, even in a small room. The technique is simple. Step one, you place your feet apart like you're about to sprint, one foot in front of the other with your knees a little bent. Step two, you raise your arms like you're about to sprint. 
one arm forward and the other behind, bent at the elbows. Step three. You begin to move your arms, only though, as though you were sprinting, swinging them back and forth in a running fashion. Make sure that you've got plenty of space around you to do so. And you move your arms as fast as you can for about 30 to 60 seconds each time. Step four, you take a break, then you repeat this exercise again and again until you are exhausted, like the same as if you were doing the sprinting exercise outside. And there you have it, a simple movement you can do anywhere. You can wave your arms around, well, to process out that adrenaline out of your system. And with that, you have my approach to managing stress, which I hope serves you should you ever need it. When people think of managing time, the most common method utilized across numerous industries, roles, professions, and beyond is to-do lists. Many people will say at the mere mention of to-do lists that they are experts with their to-do lists, even offering their knowledge and expertise to improve your to-do lists. Through this part of Surviving Thriving, I will share methods to maximize your to-do lists, transforming your relationships with them, so that instead of you working for them, they work for you. Now, coming back to people saying they know so much about to-do lists, when I was developing this very program, I shared with a manager at the time that I was working on it, and they said immediately, I know a lot about to-do lists. In fact, I plan my entire year. I said, you. You, you know everything will happen with, within a year? He answered, yes. Now, without a crystal ball or time machine, there is no way to predict the future. But they did have a point. We are aware of numerous things that we can plan for in a year. This led me to develop the big to small approach to to-do lists. The big to small to-do list model starts by writing down everything for the entire year. For example, when your insurance is due for renewal, project submission dates, and so on. Warning, this can be terrifying when you do this at first, for you will see everything you have to do in a year. Just remember that you have an entire year to complete it. Once you have the year to-do list ready, you use prioritization to identify when things need to commence and be completed. So next comes monthly to-do lists, weekly to-do lists, and finally daily to-do lists. This system allows you to focus on what is needed now, not being distracted by what is coming, with the knowledge that you will address it when it arrives. This method embodies the mentality that helped me handle most work and tasks. Before embracing this mentality, I would work like crazy to complete the task, job, or work, looking forward to the break as the reward I deserved only to receive more work and more work. The mentality is imagining our work and roles and jobs are like being on a conveyor belt. Work comes in, you complete the task, and more work will come. By embracing this mentality, we approach this type of work like a marathon instead of a sprint, pacing ourselves and not being disappointed when another mile looms over the horizon or that following tasks lands on our desks. Before we look further into to-do lists, I will share a story of when I worked briefly with a former British Army analyst. This analyst was employed as a consultant to review the performance and efficiency of the NHS Community Mental Health Team, CMHET for short, I was working in. The analyst sat with me for a whole day, observing the how I worked and writing down every step I took concerning the work I was completing. He did this with several team members, watching how we worked, how many people we supported, time spent on each task, and so on. The analyst found that the CMHT I was working in was operating at 110% efficiency based on the numbers of staff employed compared to the services and appointments offered and provided to those patients. When he presented his findings to the team leaders and executives, they were overjoyed at, <laughs> at these product productivity levels. The analysts stated immediately that this was a really bad situation to be in. The analyst stated this situation was bad due to the British military work equation. 
The CMHD was at 110% efficiency due to the team members not taking holidays. They were not taking time off for sickness unless they were bedridden and they worked overtime. This was a recipe for burnout, which has an accumulative effect. For one team member will go off with sickness or burnout. Their workload is then spread across the remaining team members who were already past capacity, leading to increased strain and overtime and more importantly, burnout. The effect on the service team members is like falling dominoes. The British military have worked with people for many years. During this time, they have developed an equation for calculating the maximum efficiency of any service, and I would suggest individuals. They factor in three components when reviewing the potential efficiency of any service. These are number one, holidays. Everyone deserves and needs a break from time to time. Number two, sickness. Eventually, everyone will experience some form of illness that will impact their ability to work. Number three, the unknown. Whenever we set off in any endeavor, it is impossible to foresee all potential risks, circumstances, and potential outcomes. So the British military factors this into their initial plans, allowing space for these unknowns to be managed when and if they present themselves. The British military calculates these elements into efficiency of any system, organization, and I would say individuals, finding that they can operate at a maximum of 70 to 80% efficiency. Here's an example of how most people design their time when calculating when they can complete a task. Imagine you are due to write an essay, to which we apply the British military equation over a four week period. 70 to 80 percent over of a four week average is out at three weeks to complete that essay. You may plan to have one week for research, one week to write the main body, and one week to produce the introduction, conclusion, and proofread. If everything goes as planned, you may have a week to reward yourself with as you finish at the time you set. Let's imagine though that things don't go as you plan. You couldn't find the research you hoped for in the first week. Thanks to the equation, you can allocate a few days for further study. At times like these though, I always remember some advice I received from a PhD student I supported regarding research. They said that every day someone is publishing something. It is often actually six months out of date by the time it is published. With this in mind, you could research forever. They said that you have to draw a line in the sand somewhere, saying this is as far or what I could find, analyze and write about in the time I had available, for you have to submit something when it is due. Imagine that something does not go as you intended during your essay production. Your washing machine breaks, the roof leaks, or worse, your computer stops working. Tip for anyone, always back up your work. If you had planned every day, hour and second for the four weeks, you would not have any space to accommodate these unforeseen circumstances. Thanks to working with a 70 to 80% efficiency approach, you have space to address any of these potential unknown situations and still meet the due date of your essay. Look to incorporate this equation into how you strategize your time and your to-do lists. I hope you noticed another element that improves to-do lists effectiveness, breaking tasks down. So often we write down a big job, forgetting to mention the numerous elements required to complete such a task. For example, an essay. Some people may write an essay on their to-do lists, but as we mentioned previously, it involves research, writing, inductions, conclusions, proofreading, and so much more. Each a task of its own, breaking tasks down into their fundamental elements captures our realities. Have you ever reached the end of your day and looked at your to-do list and said, is, is that all I've done? How useless am I? Going on to berate yourself? This is an example of to-do lists not capturing your reality. You have done many things in your day, but they were not on your to-do list, therefore not registered. You may have cared for a friend or a family member, walked your dog, cooked your meals for the week, done your laundry, and so on. Perhaps the task on your to-do list is multifaceted, complicated tasks with numerous subtasks not reflected on your to-do list. 
Going forward, I want you to note down everything you do daily, allowing you to see your reality. More than this, it allows you to start seeing your distractions. Document everything you do during your day. Start to see how much time you spend on your phone, not related to your work. For our phones are designed to grab and more importantly keep our attention, which they do incredibly well. I suggest putting your phone on do not disturb or airplane mode or even off when you wish to focus. Review all the tabs on your program and programs open on your computer. If they're not related to your work, close them. Review all of your distractions and see which you can eliminate and which you can manage. For example, a friend knocks on your door while you're writing an essay, an important document, asking if you would like a cup of tea. You answer, yes, yes, uh, decaf, no sugar, thanks. You turn back to your work, your document, saying, oh God, where, where was I? Taking 20, 30 minutes to find your way back to where you were. Going forward in such situations, I suggest putting a sign on your door saying, person at work, come back at lunchtime. So the next time your friend comes to offer that drink and that kindness, they say, oh, oh yeah, I'll come back later. Protect your workspace and reduce your distractions. The more you can focus on your work, the greater chance you have of getting your work done. For one of better phrase, you must devote yourself to your work to be able to do your work. Freeing yourself of past tasks. Imagine you have been working so hard on a project or an essay for weeks or even longer. You reach submission time and you submit your work. Shortly after, you receive an email stating that your work has been received and you will hear an outcome in due course. Has anyone ever said, is, is that it? I have been slogging my guts out for all this time and I get a poxy little email saying they got it? In these situations, I find these people are carrying all of the anxiety, stress and strain of the entire period. The end does not equate to all the emotions still residing within them. Here is a psychologically proven technique to improve a to-do list and manage such long-term stressful situations. It involves drawing a little checkbox at the end of each task. When you complete it, you check that checkbox. By checking the tasks and the checkbox of it, your brain starts to, to acknowledge that you have completed something. So your mind starts to feel relief. Going beyond this, I would like you to put a big thick line through that task, like you are scratching that thing out of your life, removing it from your existence. This allows you to see this task is completed, not just from like one meter, but maybe even five meters away. By checking things off, uh, off and scratching that tasks out of your life, you are, uh, you are not only letting yourself know that you've completed these tasks, but you also give yourself permission to let go of the burden they have placed upon you. So the next time you arrive at a situation when you submit and complete that big project or equivalent, you are not carrying all the strain from the first day. You are simply checking off another task from the numerous ones before. Finally, here are the key points I'd like you to take away from this section. Number one, big to small to-do list model. Building annual, monthly, weekly, and daily to-do lists based on prioritization allows you to focus on your current tasks, knowing the rest are in hand when they arrive. Number two, the British military equation. 70 to 80% efficiency model allows for sickness, breaks, and more importantly, the unknown. Number three, check boxes. Allow you to let go of the stress of that task. Number four, scratching that thing, drawing the line through that completed task increases the effectiveness of letting go of the stress. And there you have it. That is my approach to time management, which I hope serves you in the future, your in future endeavors. To begin, I'd like you to take a moment to think of a sentence or a phrase where you use the word procrastination in a positive way. When I've asked this question in sessions, seminars, and events, the most common answers I receive will be, procrastination allowed me to clean up my room. Procrastination allowed me to plan my holiday, or similar. To be honest though, most people I have asked this very question have struggled to find an answer which can be viewed as positive. Even the 
answers, are, which I've listed, are byproducts of avoiding what they should have been engaging in. The reason I ask this question is to highlight that the word procrastination is a negative judgment. You cannot use the word procrastination without thinking of that productive thing you should be doing instead. From our observations, the two states of procrastination and productivity are often engaged in a dance. To understand the dance, we must first understand procrastination's true purpose. Procrastination's true purpose is relaxation, to alleviate the stress and strain caused by the pressure of being productive. In our modern society, productivity equals validity. You are a valid human being if you have produced X amount, worked X hard done and completed X and so on, then you are allowed to take a break or even have a holiday or and so on. For productivity equals validity. That is, for a better phrase, our modern day society's motto. This equation in reality equals pressure. For if you are not producing, you are not a valid human being. Therefore, you are not worthy of breathing the same air as all the other hardworking individuals. I received a wonderful phrase from someone I supported in the past who, when they heard this phrase and this material, and they permitted me to use this phrase they created going forward. Procrastination. Relaxing without relaxing. Think about it. When you procrastinate, what are you really doing? You're trying to relax, but your mind is always aware of the thing you're meant to be doing whilst you're procrastinating. Not doing what you feel you should be doing and not being productive. Consequently, you are not really relaxing, not really alleviating the stress or strain you are feeling, never truly relaxing. If I asked you to use the word relaxation in a positive way, the answers you could generate would be numerous compared to the short list at best you found yourself thinking about with procrastination. For many people know hundreds if not thousands of benefits relaxation can have for the human body. We come back to the dance of procrastination and productivity. Productivity builds pressures on us and procrastination comes in to reduce that pressure through avoidance. But this causes the pressure from productivity to grow further as time has reduced, to produce the result as we were tasked to do. Procrastination avoids even harder trying to manage this mounting pressure, which leads to less time to complete the task productivity requires. You start to calculate how many hours, minutes, or even seconds it would take to complete that task if you continue to procrastinate. Avoidance in the animal world and early human existence was a beneficial way to stay safe and alive. Animals will avoid areas they recognize predators can hunt. For example, gazelles will avoid high grass areas due to the potential of being attacked by lions or equivalent. Humans learn to avoid certain foods which cause illness or even death. In our modern day society, other than a, the, list, what, the situations I've listed, avoidance certainly in the world of work or education, avoidance of tasks and projects, exams as such, does not benefit us. An example of procrastination at work. You start watching um, an ep episode of one of your favorite TV shows. The episode ends on a cliffhanger. You then say, oh, I'll just watch one more episode to see what happens. Before you know it, you're at the end of the box set. It's the early hours of the next day and you're saying, how did I get here? I only have X amount of time left to complete this task. I have to work now. For many people, this can lead to an all-nighter where you work the, throughout the night to meet that submission date. Now we understand the dance that happens between these two states. We need to change that relationship. Starting with language is a good place to begin. When you find yourself procrastinating, saying to yourself, I'm procrastinating, remember that this is a negative judgment. Catch yourself. Procrastination's true purpose is relaxation which is a healthy thing. So change your words to, I am relaxing. Now that you are relaxing, we must protect it so that you get what you deserve more frequently. I suggest you have at least 30 minutes to an hour daily, depending on what you can accommodate. By having this allocated time to relax, you protect 
contain and manage it so it does not get out of hand. Procrastination is most dangerous when it is not time limited and not controlled. Just another 30 minute episode turning into three, four, five or more hours down the road. Here's some key things I'd like you to remember. Number one, procrastination is a negative judgment. Number two, remember relaxation is essential and healthy. Number three, protect your relaxation periods with allotted time slots. Number four, keep to your time slots. Have you ever bumped into a friend after you've just finished a big project, exam or similar challenging experience where they ask what you've just done? You share that you've just finished that challenging task. They then ask you, what are you going to do to reward yourself? You answer, I'm going to go and start the next challenge. The reward you are giving yourself is more work. Thinking about it, do you see how this is not a reward? We all need time off. We all deserve rewards after we've given our all. Remember, it is that it all depends on the situation that we occupy though. What I mean by this is, should you be sleep deprived, emotionally drained, stressed or worse, these factors impact on our best at that time. So what you give in that moment is all you can give in that situation. Now returning to rewards, why would anyone be enthusiastic about a reward that is more of the thing that has been causing you stress, strain or worse? That is not a motivational reward. Most people, when they finish a stressful period of work, usually will sleep for as long as they can. Now I do not advocate against rest or sleep when we need it, but this is not what I call a reward. For all you are doing is meeting your basic needs, which have been neglected due to the situation that occupied your life. To be motivated in such situations, we need to have rewards that balance the impact and the stress and strain they took upon us. Numerous studies have confirmed that reward structures are more effective at motivating people than punishment structures. A simple example is the carrot and the stick analogy. This analogy depicts a donkey being motivated by two methods. One rewards a donkey with a carrot for its labors, and the other uses a stick to hit the donkey to motivate it through punishment. If you imagine this situation on a long enough scale, it becomes apparent the outcome. If you only hit the donkey to motivate it to move, eventually it will tire and be unable to move, for it has not received enough nourishment to complete its work. The reward system, on the other hand, providing carrots and uh, hopefully a few more varied diets, will give the energy, resources and nourishment donkey requires to continue his work for the long term. With this in mind, I encourage you to reward yourself at every opportunity. Rewards can be hard though to squeeze in at times, especially when we have another submission date following or maybe you're in the middle of an exam season or equivalent. Taking 5, 10, 15 or even 30 minute periods to reward yourself at times like these can be really beneficial. Rewards don't have to be big. Of course, depending on your resources, they can be as big as you can access. What matters is whether the reward you provide embodies the effort you exerted. Here are two examples of rewards I have from time to time. The first is a little chocolate bar called a Freddo bar. It has a picture of a frog on the front and is sold primarily in the UK for a very long time. It used to cost me 10 pence when I was a boy. Now it's gone up and up with inflation. Isn't that a great thing, eh? Well, it's not made of the best organic produce, but no matter how old I get, the little boy inside me bounces still at the thought of one. Now, have you ever devoured something so quickly that your taste buds barely, if at all, acknowledge the food that entered your mouth? Instead, what if you savored each and every bite? What if you approach your meal with the sense of ceremony? Ceremony can take a bite of food you barely even taste to a moment that genuinely lifts your spirits and your day. Every bite you take, you say, this is a gift for me. 
This is my reward for all my hard work. This is a gift I deserve. That chocolate bar is not forgotten. Instead, it is imprinted on your taste buds for hours, if not longer, for it is magnified through the ceremonial reward you earned. Now, the second reward is a much healthier one, where you walk somewhere you enjoy, like a park or a woodland, savoring every step as a gift to yourself. Every bird song is a serenade of your hard work, and each and each and every lung full of clean air is healthy air, of, uh, which is a breath of freedom for you. I encourage you the latter way more than the Freddo bar, but you choose what you like. The word earn, though, has incredible connotations in our psyches. I argue due to our education systems, indoctrination of rewards granted by external parties who deem what is earned and what is not. I put forward the re that rewards are earned in response to effort, not outcome. What I mean by this is you do your best. You reward yourself accordingly. The outcome, hopefully, is a lovely cherry on the top. Remember what I said earlier. Your best depends on the environment you occupy at that time. You may, for example, say, I would have done better if I hadn't fallen ill or wasn't traveling and so on. Then you did the best you could in that situation, despite those circumstances. So when you weigh your efforts, consider the entire situation and honor all of it, especially you. This word is used so often and so frequently in our modern day lives. Do you know how the psychological mind interprets the word deadline? In our minds, this term literally translates to line of death. Cross it and you will die. Now, line of death can be incredibly anxiety triggering, which does not improve concentration or performance despite numerous work environments encouraging it. Here's an example. In a quiz, you hear the question, who played the character Neo in the Matrix movie franchise? At that moment, you, you can't remember that person's name. It, it's on the tip of your tongue, but you just it just won't come out, you know? Later that evening, as you get a glass of water or something, you blurt out, Keanu Reeves! Everyone around you looks at you wondering, what provoked that outburst? As you explain, but, you know, the, the character who played Neo in The Matrix was Keanu Reeves. From the quiz early, you know? In this situation, what happened to, to many of us is that we send the request to our memory banks for a piece of information while under stress. And the cortisol or other equivalent neurological chemicals impacts our brain's response, delaying the acquisition of that requested information. As your brain's neurological chemical balance returns to a calm and relaxed state, so does its speed. And the information request flies to the front of your mind and you blurt out the answer, Keanu Reeves. It is well documented that people are much more efficient when relaxed than in an anxious state. To encourage this state, I suggest changing the word deadline to its actual title. Due date, submission date, completion date, all words that capture the same meaning as you find. That is the true definition of the word deadline. But these alternative phrases do not contain the word dead, meaning death. And therefore your anxiety is not triggered and your brain can operate at its full potential. Warning though, for this approach to work, you must change the word deadline universally. For where will your concentration go if you leave one deadline in your mindset? Of course, it will go to the word deadline, for your consciousness needs to keep you alive and safe. Everything else will melt into the background if you do this. But whenever you hear people talking about deadlines, you say inside your head, due date, completion date, or so on, for that is what it really is. And with that, you have my approach to managing procrastination, which I hope serves you as you progress through your challenges. Facing failure is an inevitable part of life's journey. Our current education system often paints failure as the ultimate endpoint, discouraging us from seeing it as a stepping stone to success. But imagine if that was truly the case. So many incredible achievements from the Wright brothers' first flight to the computing power in our handheld devices would never have come to fruition. 
Did you know that many successful business moguls were declared bankrupt one or more times before founding hugely successful multinational companies? It is calculated that it takes a minimum of 10,000 hours of perfect practice to become a genius in something. That's not just any practice. It's about honing a skill to the point where it becomes almost second nature. If people followed the educational model of, for dealing with failure universally throughout our lives, many of us would have never learned to walk. For walking is, for want of a better phrase, an incredible feat, where we actively defy gravity. For gravity is pulling us down every minute, second, and millisecond of every day. Despite this, the act of walking defies this never-ending, never-compromising force upon us. Let's consider walking for a moment. We defy gravity on our little tiny feet, balancing our entire bodies, constantly pulled down by the force of gravity. That's a monumental task. So many of us take it for granted because so many people do it every day, despite the trials and tribulations we went through to gain this skill. Most of us cannot remember what we went through to learn to walk. Parents, though, often remember the process their children went through on their walking journey. Many may have feared their children may end up with peculiar-shaped heads, following all the falls they experienced as they took their first steps. If we had followed the education system's approach to failure, it may have gone a little like this. You stand up and then you fall down. You then say, well, that didn't work. I'm gonna stick with crawling. I'm good at that. Ending our walking journey. Instead, human determination kicks in. The determination to learn and gain this new skill, despite all the falls, bumps, and potential bruises, and anything else which happens along the way. Each stumble was not a failure, it was a lesson. We discovered what maintained our balance and did not. Our first taste of the scientific process. Just like scientists who repeat experiments to understand why things work, we learn from each fall, gaining insights. We do the same with each and every stumble, fall, collision, and beyond. We have in the process of learning to walk. None of them were failures. Instead, they are lessons to learn from, gain the knowledge to walk, maybe even run, jump, and so much more. Going forward, I invite you to approach all situations from the perspective of lessons we can learn from, instead of failures which stop us or even worse, define us. When we approach from a place of learning, we embrace growth, transformation, and the ability to ascend to the heights we are made for, and the realization of our true limitless potential. And with that, you have completed the entire Surviving to Thriving program, which I hope serves you as you navigate your way to the life you deserve. If you did find this helpful, please do like and subscribe as it really helps the channel. And should you know anyone who could benefit from this video, please share it with them. Finally, should you like to access a richer and more fulfilling life full of joy, happiness, love, and so much more, then I am proud to announce after 20 years in the making, my work, The Compass, which is now available in the form of a book as well as an online program, which you will find links to in the description below this very video. Take care of yourselves and ciao for now.